Good morning, everybody. Uh, our Ukrainian cousins. They're cousins, but not brothers. The Russians and Carpatha Russians were, were close cousins. Uh, for West Slavs, they're a bit more removed from uh, where you are and uh, who we ha all have become. The, uh, I'm going, my aim is to survey the 1,200 years and thousands of square miles that uh, many of us have, that the Rus people, the, of which the Ukrainians are one, uh, have lived in and uh, developed our cultures through that time. I want to point out the similarities that we have and some of the differences and the uh, challenges over through those centuries. Uh, it, on the screen, you can see the uh, different ancient tribes that were uh, settled throughout Europe. Uh, the you can see the uh, conflict that there is in the presentations uh, of uh, maps purporting to show Slavic tribes 600 to 1,000 uh, current era, and they are shown according to the modern concept of these language groups and the uh, cultural groups. Uh, a thousand years ago, uh, we can uh, cast some strong doubts as to uh, the validity of that. There's also the variety of names that are assigned. If you look up other names uh, from maps drawn about the same time, you'll see a variety of names that don't always match uh, with what uh, is shown on the screen here. The, uh, and the, the, what I want to point out is the nebulousness of a lot of this information. It goes back into prehistory, very first references, the uh, conflicting references and items that were written for the very first time 100, 200 years after the fact. Uh, they depend upon unreliable sources, perhaps. So some of these names uh, might have come down in uh, different languages, uh, different variations. Uh, it's a, a big mishmash. Up in the uh, corner, you'll see, up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the Hoods and the Slovenes and the Kravinci, Kravinci as uh, three of the highlighted tribes. Those uh, will become important uh, later as uh, the three tribes that are named as people who invited the Rus to initially come down and to uh, govern them and to bring some uh, peace uh, to their to their realms. Uh, I'll be using some modern terminology today uh, for simplicity and speed. Uh, where other people talk about ethnicity, I'll be referring to nations in the European fashion, the uh, Hungarian nation, the Slovak nation, the Polish nation, as peoples, and not just as a political thing. I'll be referring to the Rus in general, uh, in the spirit of the term Ruthenian, and which has developed uh, into the identity of the Eastern Slavic peoples. And I want to point out how we've developed into four basic roots of today. Uh, we'll get into all of that. So we've covered the uh, generalities of things. You can see again on the map, the uh, Area of the Avars was unassigned on this uh, map. The area of the Balts is not broken down further into the different tribes that have been identified as Baltic at that time. So again, it's a, a very general map and as accurate as can be. And uh, there's quite a bit of room for interpretation, unfortunately. It's not, uh, we don't live in a precise, uh, with the precise history. Along with all of this, we have the thousand years in which all of these people came and went, mixed and fought and loved, and had uh, many thousands of uh, many other tribes come through, the Armenians, the Greeks, the Wallachians, the Khazars, Tatar and Mongol, Peshnik, Magyar, and even the uh, Scotsmen are recorded as having come up there and stayed for a while. So inaccuracy and interpretation is built into the story. Everybody loves a Viking story particularly, and they love to claim Viking ancestry. The three tribes invited the Vikings. It was the Eastern Vikings, uh, primarily from 
Sweden and Gotland, the island of Gotland, who uh, explored the east and established the, uh, the trading routes through there. They were traders, they were warriors, they were traveling salesmen, and they did what uh, comes natural along with uh, all that traveling. The, uh, they, so around 860, uh, 682, they came, uh, were invited in. They uh, established several of their bases along the rivers and slowly they consolidated their powers along the river routes and then along the uh, ex pre-existing trading routes and uh, expanded further and further until they established uh, what became uh, Kiev Rus in our modern terminology. Now, if you have ambitions to claim Viking um, ancestry because your DNA came back with some Scandinavian, then I would propose instead of going back 1,200 years or more, uh, consider the Polish deluge that took place when Sweden invaded Poland for uh, two years and rampaged back and forth around the 1690s. That event took place some 800 years closer to our time and might be more likely to be the source of any Swedish um, uh, ancestry that you do have. So on slide two, uh, we show the key roots and the uh, roots of our four uh, roots. The main routes follow the rivers far to the east of our peoples, and the Vistula through Poland is different. It has very little archaeological evidence of traffic, which indicates this was a secondary occasional route. Important for the people uh, in the West, the Poles and the Carpathian Russians who settled into the uh, Carpathian Mountains, just indicating that there was less contact, that uh, there would be, uh, if there was any contact, it would be more overland or um, much more seldom than uh, through the Russian and the uh, Ukrainian areas. What did traveling through thousands of square miles incur? What did it mean in the days of wilderness and, uh, wilderness and uh, rivers? Old records provide us with two examples. One where land travel took uh, one week to cover 200 miles uh, cutting cross land, where sea travel in the same report says uh, two weeks uh, covered 1,000 miles. That, in 1070, another record tells us that it took four weeks over land uh, to cover the same ground that uh, took only five days by water. So things were tremendously faster at that time uh, over, over the water and uh, over the rivers, and as well as uh, the difficulty in carrying the, uh, the trade goods. Perhaps a, a proper comparison would be with the Hudson Bay Company in the 1700s traveling through Canada. The invitation to come and govern was uh, from those three tribes in the Northeast there, uh, as dated around 860. By 1050, the Kiev uh, Rus was established and it reached its greatest extent. And after that, they had waxed and waned with their uh, political powers, their political influence and the uh, influence that they had over their confederation. I want to call it a confederation of uh, a loose chain of princes who ruled their local principalities or dukedoms and uh, under uh, tribute and um, loyalty to the uh, primary prince in uh, Kiev. The, uh, this ended uh, in when the Mongols came in and burned Kiev in 1240, uh, the year before that they in, uh, invaded Poland and Hungary. The Mol Mongols after that time stayed on, down in the southern steppe and, and uh, became known as the Golden Horde. At that time, they imposed their Pax Mongolia on the Rus. Uh, in Rus Russian history, it's reported as a great tragedy. Um, <laughs> as a non-Russian, I can read the histories and uh, see, a, see that there's a legitimacy to a Pax Mongolia. They kept uh, the internecting fire, uh, fighting down to a low level among the uh, various Rus. And the Mongol, uh, again, from the uh, distances and the uh, 
uh, difficulty of uh, land travel had their least uh, influence on the uh, northwestern and the Carpathian reaches of the area. The roots of the four, uh, four roofs uh, result in Belarus, which was in union with Lithuania for centuries. It had the lightest Mongol incursion and duration, and it shared the Litra Lithuanian identity that I'll be uh, covering more of later. They were Orthodox, they coexisted well with the pagan Lithuanians, and uh, as well as with the Roman uh, Christianity, uh, living in Lithuania with all of the competition between the different faiths. The Carpathian Rus, my people, are distant from Kiev and from the Mongol, close to the Hungarian and the Polish influence, and it shows in the languages and the cultures, etc. There's a long exposure to Byzantine and the Uniat uh, churches, and we were reputedly Christianized first by Cyril and Methodius in the year 863, long before Vladimir uh, came to Kiev in uh, 988. Then the Ukrainian Rus. Uh, transition from Kiev Rus Federation to the Mongol uh, rule, the Lithuanian Rus organization that came down and uh, took over the Ukrainian lands, which was succeeded by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So they had all this extended time over uh, with influence from various uh, Western and Central European forces. Uh, Central European one Swedish geographer located the center of Europe as about 15, 25 kilometers north of the city of Vilnius, Lithuania. So we are talking Central Europe by different uh, definitions. Most Czechoslovaks like to claim the center of Europe is in uh, Czechoslovak Republic, but the Lithuanians have a good argument. Uh, the Muscovy Rus, the Russians, I uh, have a late start to history. After the Ma Pax Mongolia rule, they expanded and subsumed the Finns and the other northern Rus, the other uh, northern cities, and they early on exhibited the desire to rule all Russias, and which extends uh, unfortunately to uh, to today as well. Well, as an example of a uh, principle that has been used throughout history in composing history, writing it, uh, things I've run across in Hungarian history quite a bit, and something I just used now in my reference to the Russians having a late start to history. I, one of my favorite quotations is, he slyly chose the least flattering description. Un unfortunately, too often we do run across that in, in our histories. More seriously, we face the restrictions of our English language when we are talking about this. To quote Count Henry Krasinski from about 1844, it is to be regretted that there is no difference in English as in Polish and French between Ruski and Ruskiye, Rusian and Rusa, Rus and Rosia, Russia et Teres, uh, Lucianus, many historical errors would be avoided if we had that uh, capability of drawing this distinction between the different forms of Rus. Uh, to the left, you see a map, uh, the red showing generally the uh, Polish-Lithuanian, the Polish, uh, pardon me, the red is the Lithuanian Rus Union that uh, took place before uh, the uh, Polish Lithuanian uh, Union. And the uh, purple lines uh, and along with the red indicate uh, the extent, the maximum extent of uh, either or both of those unions. The Lithuania Rus preceded the PLC by several centuries. Its official title was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Rus and Samogotia. The northern, northwestern Rus princes, say in Belarus today, 
were in union with Lithuania by 1263 and provided the scribes and the literacy that provided the chancery language of Lithuania as it grew into po power. As the Lith Rus replaced the Golden Horde in governing the Ukrainian lands after 1240, um, they, they burned uh, uh, Kiev, and then in the 1500s, uh, Lithuania Rus expanded to the south, and then uh, uh, the Lithuanian Rus uh, shared Kiev uh, for a while and then took over from the Golden Horde and continued expanding their interest. In 1386, they came into union with Poland for the first time. Now, this was a uh, sharing a common monarch, and they governed this way in union um, uh, in a multi, uh, mutual self-defense act. And the uh, uh, eventually that had to be replaced uh, in 1569 by the uh, formal Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. A peculiarity to modernize is the attraction of the Lithuanian identity and uh, how many people impressed me for uh, wishing to be identified as Litva. I noticed this with Jewish friends who families came from Poland who happened to be geographically from Lithuania and they referred to themselves as Polish Jews, Litvans. And then uh, in history, I keep reading about all these Litvans, the Rus, the Belarus, the Lithuanian, uh, being Lithuanians, and uh, the Belarus fighting with the uh, Lithuanians in 1993 over who owned the Vitautas or the uh, coat of arms. They finally settled with the Lithuanians having the horse's tail up, the uh, Belarus with the horse's tail tail down. The Poles followed sweet, sweet and uh, that, and uh, in their classic patriotic Polish book, Pan Tadeus, uh, they be, the book itself begins with, Lithuania, my fatherland, you are like health. How much you must be valued will only be discovered by the one who has lost you. Now, jumping back to the form of uh, the early, Poland, Lithuania, and reading the histories and the broad varieties of peoples, the nations who lived within Poland, Lithuania, I have to identify this as a land of tolerance. Lithuania was the last pagan nation in Europe. Many peoples, religions, languages all found home and found comfort and uh, created that as a home. They were all tolerated and accepted quite well. East and West Christians, pagans, Muslims, half of the European Jewry. These last created a rich culture, vibrant in forms, cultures and ideas, uh, their own conflicts and such. And with the partition of the Commonwealth, prejudice took different forms in the seceding lands of Austria, Prussia, and in Russia. And in Russia, Catherine the Great created the, what it became known as the Russian Pale in 1791. We know the tragic history of the genocide that followed in this area, but it is quite notable that it uh, so strongly overlays one uh, overlaying the other. Uh, all good things must come to an end and the partition of Poland took place in 1772. It was really not just the partition of Poland, which is a, a short acronym or a short term used to refer to the partition of uh, Poland and Lithuanian Commonwealth. That uh, was at the time uh, the largest nation in Europe. This was uh, partitioned by Prussia, Russia, and Austria, each of them taking their uh, portion. Austria-Hungary didn't ex uh, exist at that time. It wasn't created until 1867. So that, uh, that I'm correct in referring to Austria rather than Austria-Hungary. This was the first time that the Russian borders moved west. Up until then, there had always been this Polish-Lithuanian buffer between Europe and Russia. And then the Mus uh, this, with this partition, the Muscovy 
Russians, the Muscovy Rus, managed to actually move west. The, um, and the modern Ukraine was split between Austria, which is in the lower left corner there in that uh, purple map, which uh, the Austrians chose to resurrect the ancient kingdom of Halitsia Lodomira and uh, call that uh, one of their provinces. They took it directly under Austrian administration and wisely politically chose the uh, Poles, the Polish nobility, as their, their administrators and the uh, uh, which uh, kept, uh, by and large, kept a large part of the Polish nobility peaceful and happy, whereas the uh, Polish uh, peasants uh, didn't have a voice in things, never had a voice, and uh, were, to a large degree, not even considered uh, Polish by many of their people, by the, uh, by the noble uh, peoples. Uh, and the tolerance that seemed to permeate uh, the old uh, settle settlements uh, seemed to disperse with that. Well, that uh, continu continued to exist uh, through uh, the war in 1914 when that came up and World War II arrived in, uh, in, in uh, Central Europe, a great tragedy. Here we see in blue, the outline of uh, modern Ukraine. In red, the uh, outline of modern Poland. And then in uh, several of the other broken lines, the dashed lines showing the extent of the Western battles and, the, uh, uh, and to the Far East. Uh, in the, uh, uh, all of this area, Uh, had suffered from uh, battles and uh, the armies waltzing back and forth. We'll be covering that in detail. The, uh, but Galicia and uh, Lviv were never occupied by Russia until the war in 1914-1915 when uh, they conquered a good part of uh, partitioned Poland and then uh, were beaten back by 1916 and uh, pushed back into uh, Ukraine and such. Uh, this is just a more common, uh, commonly accepted uh, popular uh, war map of the time without the modern borders. I have to say I have nothing but contempt for the three emperors and their generals. They brought a tremendous concentration of incompetence in choosing to go to war and having the bad judgment to choose and conduct a war that not only led to the demise of their empires, but also to the loss of many millions of their subjects who were proved themselves far more worthy of their governments than their governments uh, proved themselves worthy of them or capable of producing, uh, governing them in a reasonable and good fashion. The Austria-Hungary Austria languages uh, in the army, uh, Austria-Hungary was a multinational country and uh, faced tremendous problems with the languages. The officers, professional officers, had to have uh, four or five languages that they were capable of uh, conducting. There were minimum lists of hung, uh, German and uh, Hungarian command words uh, that were uh, all of the soldiers were supposed to learn. And uh, in the heavy fighting of the first nine months of the war, they lost a tremendous number of their officers, one third of them by the end of September. And by the end of April, when the uh, uh, Russians were finally uh, being pushed back. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian army had lost about 60% of their original professional army. Uh, the Germans had uh, taken over a large part of the lead of that war. And the, it is said, and um, perhaps with some justification, that uh, the Austro-Hungarian army was nothing but a National Guard a after that point. But I think that with the battles and the performances that they showed 
continuing to fight in the eastern reaches in Ukraine and such, that they had, uh, in dint of battle, they had uh, learned their lessons and they had developed their uh, good officers and the good leadership that they had, that they should have had at the beginning of the war. On languages, the Austro-Hungarian army had pre-printed postcards that uh, soldiers could send back to their uh, families, and on the on that uh, there were standard phrases like "I am doing well," "I am uh, uh, doing fine," uh, and in uh, twelve different languages on the one postcard, all the uh, soldier had to do was find his language and circle the phrase that he wished to do, uh, wished to express to his family at the time. The Austro-Hungarians constantly complained throughout the war that their domestic sail, uh, rail system was inadequate to their means, that they couldn't bring the troops up front, they couldn't uh, adequately supply them, that there was a failure of the rail system, not the leadership, not the organization, not the planning. That, uh, but then again, when the Russians uh, ran in and conquered uh, so much of Eastern Austria-Hungary, so quickly, the Russians were able to adapt their rail system, which was a wider gauge, and they were able to switch over to the narrower Austro-Hungarian gauge and supply their troops over a tremendously longer distance. In this, uh, in, and nobody has given the Russians uh, credit for that uh, feat of logistics. It, uh, but it is something that ended flies in the face of their common Austro-Hungarian complaints that it was uh, inadequate infrastructure that they had. The Rus and the Poles and the Ukrainians and the Romanians all lived along the borders between the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians and uh, they ended up with people of their nations fighting on both sides, uh, fighting against one another on the front lines and occasionally reaching their own degree of peace uh, saying why should I shoot uh, my comrade across the, the lines when we speak the same language we come from neighboring villages and but uh, by and large these nations proved quite loyal throughout the long and dreary four years of war uh, to their original uh, rulers and the original nations. The Austrians and Hungarians distrusted the Rus and they distrusted, distrusted the Jewish subjects and subjected them to a treatment worthy of enemy uh, people uh, with concentration camps for the Rus in Tallerhof with uh, hangings and shootings and uh, burnings of the villages. There were accusations of spies all you had to do was raise your uh, shades. Uh, when some of the houses were burnt out of revenge, uh, they would blame the uh, family of the house uh, for burning their own house as a signal to the Russians to draw in the, uh, uh, let them to know, to let them know where the uh, Austro-Hungarian army was located and such. There were villages uh, that were burned wholesale because uh, they, accused them of taking a pot shot at uh, the, the soldiers. Uh, it, it was just a horrible situation and uh, Orthodox priests were uh, summarily hung. Uh, the, uh, there's a reference that I'll, uh, I'll give you at the end of the show about uh, uh, by uh, a Romanian officer, Taslanov, who describes in four or five of his instances he comes up as a persecuted Romanian army uh, officer, treated like a dog by the Hungarians and uh, in his own army. And yet he goes into Galicia and he expresses repeatedly a total distrust of all these disloyal Rus that live up in the Galician area. And it is the border area of today's Poland, Northeast area, the uh, Galician area uh, and Belarus that were in the primary battlefields. The civilians paid the price and soldiers lost and also in civilian casualties, which then as now, nobody bothers counting the uh, civilian casualties. 
in the small corner of Slovakia that was involved in the war, there were eight, some 80 villages that were lost, destroyed in the battles in the winter of 1914-15. There were hundreds of villages lost in uh, modern Poland. And the war unfortunately started, it unfortunately started, but it unfortunately started at the beginning of the harvest season. And so everybody lost their uh, that year's harvest, which was to come back and haunt them later. Uh, with uh, in about, It took them seven or eight months to start to realize that they didn't have adequate food stores for a long uh, duration of war. At the beginning, the Russians had, through spies, they had their Austrian war plans, and they mobilized much quicker than expected. Austro-Hungarian incompetence in plan and execution, dashing from one end to the country of the country to the other, wasting days and um, rail resources, going to Serbia and uh, reversing themselves, going back up towards Galicia. It resulted in a tremendous loss of territory, population, and resources. At the time, the north, uh, the southeast corner of Poland was the largest, a third largest oil producing country in the world with about 5% of the production, but uh, still that was one of the resources that was lost. Uh, it wasn't a highly mechanized war at the time, so it wasn't, wasn't as critical as it would prove to be later. But the Austro-Hungarians had the martial law and they unfortunately um, brought that into effect with all the civilian executions and then uh, the deportations. Now, the Russians had planned to annex uh, Galicia as part of their program to unite all of the Russias. So they arrived with a plan in hand, they arrived with some aid and some civilian administrators. Uh, they had many pro uh, promises and uh, the uh, but their harsh treatment of disillusioned many former Russophiles in the end, and uh, when they were forced uh, to withdraw, many of the people were quite happy to see them go again. Jews were very harsh, handled by the Russians very harshly. Uh, quite an extensive and harsh uh, prejudice was expressed. And, but that's another topic for another day, and it's been covered by many books. The uh, Austro-Hungarian prejudices uh, where the Jews uh, to a large degree had been assimilated and uh, the others had a high degree of tolerance uh, was very mild by comparison. Now, German Prussians required, uh, this is in the partition portion of Poland up uh, where uh, the Kalin and Grad uh, Masurian la lakes are today. The German Prussians uh, had required their own civil administrators to remain in place in case of invasion so that they could continue to organize and to serve in, uh, uh, and reassure the local populations. Thus, some relief or organized civilian retreat was possible when the civilians uh, were scared and wanted to get out of the uh, anticipated battle zone, then the local leaders were in place to help assist them in uh, organizing and in timing and in coordinating with the Austro-Hungarian and the German armies uh, for that uh, retreat. On the other hand, Austro-Hungary did precisely the opposite. They took all of their civilian leaders and they insisted that they offer no cooperation, that uh, uh, to the invading, uh, invading armies, and that uh, this would be seen as uh, uh, treason, simply uh, simply put. So some of the first to leave the, uh, the invaded areas and uh, ahead of the invading armies were the civilian administrators. This, of course, left nothing but chaos behind. When the Russians arrived, they had no leaders to talk to, nobody to coordinate with as to what facilities were available, what was not available, how, uh, nobody to work with on organizing the local civilians, on lo organizing local aid or uh, setting out uh, the local rules for um, 
conduct and for uh, food collection, food payment, and such things. Uh, and uh, on atrocities, uh, there are long lists uh, of atrocities committed on both sides. I've enumerated those uh, committed by the Austro-Hungarians. The rape and pillage of the uh, Russian army is uh, well known and well documented. The suspicions of the uh, Austro-Hungarian armies led to uh, tremendous uh, friction between the Austrian uh, and uh, Hungarian soldiers of, uh, with different various languages who couldn't communicate with the Poles or couldn't communicate with the roost of their local area. And so uh, all of this led to a much greater degree of uh, distrust and uh, damage that they they would uh, um, that they would incur and uh, blame that they would put upon the uh, civilian population. Both countries, the Russians and the Austro-Hungarian Germans, engaged in burnt, burnt ground strategies. When they retreated, they would destroy foods, they uh, stores, they would re destroy the uh, ammunition, the uh, the housing, the protection, and such. And then each, of course, accused the other of bringing in filth, lice, disease, and typhoid. This is a Rusin cottage in the Carpathian, uh, demonstrating one of the fortunate families who still had their cottage at the time. It wasn't destroyed by the uh, artillery battles or the uh, burning and the invasions and the uh, damages. Uh, here, this memento from that time identified that German army, army sued, uh, quartered their soldiers there with one carriage, one family, 20 soldiers. Uh, there is another report uh, from Taswana uh, that uh, all these villages of the Galician frontier were crammed with Jewish refugees from Galician frontier. We found rooms filled by 30 or 40 people, men, women, little girls, children, and of course, a seasoning of soldiers all sleeping together in a heap. It is difficult to manage, imagine a more complete picture of misery. So that uh, confirming and uh, even going beyond what is identified in this memento that was dug out. Villages were far and few and uh, distant. Roads were often inadequate, uh, dirt tracks were non-existent, and the weather ex uh, alternated in extremes. Uh, there were heavy snows that winter, extreme temperatures, extreme temperatures uh, swings from uh, down 20 below zero to uh, 30, 40, 50 above zero with melting and snowing and uh, rain and uh, a uh, ref reformation of ice so that uh, uh, access to the tops of the mountains and the troops and trying to supply them with food, much less food at all, much less hot food, was often quite impossible. Uh, the misery to, is just impossible to describe. That again is a topic for itself, and there are books written about that. Uh, the No, the uh, here we've got some pictures of the uh, retreating refugees from Galicia. Uh, Austria had so many hundreds of thousands of retreating uh, personnel that they had to form uh, barracks and camps in the center of the uh, country in Austria, primarily some in Hungary. Uh, to house the hundreds of thousands of different nationalities that uh, came primarily from Galicia and from uh, Bukovina along the uh, uh, the borders in the in the mountains, um, some of them arrived, many of them without organization, as uh, described, many of them without supplies, and uh, they all had to be housed and uh, fed. Uh, there, uh, nothing had been prepared ahead of time. This was a totally overlooked uh, aspect of the war that was not anticipated.
the well, and uh, to approaching the uh, conclusion, I'll say that uh, the Aust uh, the Austrian uh, War Museum has this theme that Krieg gehören and then in some museums, wars belong in museums. It's a wonderful sentiment. It's one that I fully agree with. The uh, slide at the bottom shows uh, the 1950 departure of Russians from the Lviv area, a po uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, postcard from the time, uh, some of the local propaganda. And then on one of my hikes in the Carpathians, one of the great gravestones that I had run across. Uh, a very, overall, a very sad theme, a very sad history that I'd say we share with our Ukrainian cousins. And this, this is the uh, history that we do share with, with our Ukrainian cousins. It's a sad history, one that uh, unfortunately seems to be continuing today and will continue into the future. Uh, this was a very broad brush and very quick and uh, disorganized uh, presentation of so much wonderful information. These books that I uh, have on the screen now, I highly recommend uh, that you take a screenshot and that you look at these. Uh, each of them carries much more than just the title reveals in the story. Uh, the uh, and if any of this is of interest to you, or uh, then certainly these will give you the uh, uh, the firm background on uh, what the broad story uh, is about. And I thank you kindly, and I wish you all and wish all of us uh, peace in the future. Thank you.